can run on for a long time, run on for a long time, run on for a long time. Sooner or later, God will cut you down. Sooner or later, God will cut you down. Go and tell that long-tongued liar. Go and tell that midnight rider. Tell the rambler, the gambler, the backbiter. Tell him that God's gonna cut him down. Tell him that God's gonna cut him down. Tell him that God's gonna cut him down. If you don't recognize that song, that song was popularized by a lot of different artists like Elvis Presley and even Johnny Cash. That song is an old, old song that has been around so long that it's actually been known by many different titles. Some artists who recorded that song called it God is going to cut him down. Some called it God is going to cut you down. Some people called it run on and catch this. Some people even called that song Sermon, which seems a little bit appropriate for our context today. Now, Wikipedia says that the lyrics of that song warn evildoers that they cannot escape God's eventual judgment. That, that you may be able to run on for a long time, but they say that sooner or later, God will cut you down. Happy Father's Day, everybody. Are you glad that you came to, to church today? Wow, like I don't even know if I want to be here when, when I hear stuff like that, right? But, but today we're kicking off this new series that is called The Dark Ages. And what's happening is, is we're moving deeper into the letter that Paul wrote to a group of people who lived in Rome all the way back in the first century. As we move deeper into the letter, what we are seeing is that Paul is having to address some really hard issues. And in so many ways, Paul is communicating the exact same message that Marilyn Manson communicated, that, that Elvis Presley communicated, that Johnny Cash communicated when they all recorded that song. But the message is clear, that, that if you choose to run on for a very long time, that sooner or later, there's a God who will cut you down. Now, I want to ask you a really important question before you tune me out. Well, when you hear that message, how does it make you feel? But because here's what I suspect. I suspect that if you heard that song on your playlist, you wouldn't feel bad at all. In fact, it's a catchy little tune. You might even find yourself just singing that song all throughout the day. But, but when you hear a message like that in church, I imagine that it makes you feel very different. In fact, it might make you feel nervous. But for some of you who are new to Mosaic, you may have walked in here going, what in the world did I just walk into? Like, is this going to be a hellfire and brimstone kind of church you may be thinking about leaving right now like like you're not sure what is going to play out today and in some cases it even makes people feel a little bit defensive and I get that but before you write me off or tune me out I want you to at least consider both where I'm coming from and where we are going today the whole reason that Paul wrote this letter called Romans is because Paul had some really good news to share with people. But before he could get to the good news, Paul had to be honest with people about the bad news. John Mark Comer once described the bad news in this way. He said, the bad news is that we don't just do bad things. In many cases, we want to do bad things. So, so just think about that for a minute. That if that's true of humanity, that, that we want to do bad things, and, and then we do those bad things, and then we persist in doing those bad things for a very long time, the question is, how should we expect God to respond to that? Well, Scripture tells us how He responds to that. Scripture teaches that if He really loves us, 
then he will discipline us, but only like a father disciplines the child that he loves, right? We're celebrating Father's Day today. Some of you grew up in a day and a time where you had a father that when you stepped out of line, he loved you enough to take you out to the woodshed, right? Now, he didn't just love you enough to take you to the woodshed. He loved your mom enough to take you to the woodshed so she wouldn't have to hear you screaming for the next five minutes while he wore your butt out, right? So some of you grew up in a day and a time where there was no woodshed, but there was a belt. And your father would take that belt off and he would use that to discipline you, not to pay you back, but to bring you back to the behavior that God wants to see in your life. Now, I know that we live in a day and a time where that's not politically correct or maybe socially acceptable, but the Bible is clear. The man who spares the rod spoils his child. And what's really dangerous about our parenting strategies today is that we are not just ruining our kids. We are actually ruining their understanding of God. That if kids grow up in a world where they never see mom's wrath and they never see dad's wrath, there's no way they could see that God has wrath wrath and yet God's wrath is a real thing and we all need to be willing to accept it now with that being said I want to talk a little bit about the dark ages for those of you who know your history then you know that the dark ages refers to a period of time in human history where both people and cultures struggled immensely right after the fall of the Roman Empire we're studying the book of Romans Rome was a dominant force in the world, but the empire fell. And when Rome fell, history tells us that it was like a cloud of depression fell over the entire area. So much so that people stopped being creative. People who were painters, they stopped painting. People who were writers stopped writing. People who were builders, they stopped building. In fact, they didn't even take care of the buildings they had And because of that, buildings started to crumble. And one of the greatest civilizations that has ever been known to man, it started to waste away. Now, a lot of historians talk about the Dark Ages, but generally speaking, historians have always taught that the Dark Ages lasted for a period of just over 900 years. Throughout this series, I'm going to be arguing that the Dark Ages have lasted way longer than 900 years. From the earliest days of human history until today, people have experienced life, but they have not experienced life the way that God intended for them to experience life. In fact, if you could see what God had planned for humanity all along, then you would be able to see today just how much we have screwed that plan up. You would agree that we are living in the dark ages. I saw a post one time where someone made this observation. They said this in this pic. They said that the further you get away from people, the more beautiful the world becomes. In so many ways, what that image suggests is that humanity has wrecked and ruined what God had planned both for this world and for all who are living in it. People really have suffered. Cultures really have struggled. But again, it's not just because of the fall of the Roman Empire, but the reason we struggle is because of the fall of man. The Bible calls this thing sin. And I just want you to know that from the moment that Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, everything changed and it's continued to change in a very negative way. This is the very thing that Paul is now addressing as he continues writing his letter to the Romans. He's drawing attention to the fact that humanity has been running from God for a very long time. And what that means for us today is that the way life is for us today is not at all the way that God intended for it to be. This world, this country, this coastline, Your family, your life, my family, my life, we are not experiencing life the way that God intended for us to experience life. 
Go all the way back to the beginning of Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God because they didn't trust God. They, they thought that God was somehow holding out on them. And so they decided that we're going to disobey God. We're going to eat fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because their spiritual enemy told them that if you'll just eat from that tree, then you will be like God. And in that moment, they became just like God, but not in the way that they expected. In that moment, they became completely aware of the realities of both good and evil, something that they had never known before. It's like the old Don Henley song, this was the end of the innocence. By the fourth chapter of the Bible, we had a murder on the earth. There was a guy named Cain, who killed his brother Abel out of jealousy by Genesis chapter 6. God saw that men were thinking about evil things all day, every single day. Things had gone so bad so quick that God said, we're going to have a redo. And you know what he did? He poured out his wrath on the world. He flooded the entire earth, and everyone died under the judgment of God except for Noah and his family, because they were people of faith who had a faith enough to build the ark that would allow them to survive the flood and the judgment of God. Paul, as he is writing this section in the book of Romans, he is actually reflecting on this period of human history and the negative impact that sin has had on the world. He paints a picture that is really not all that different than the picture of the dark ages. It is a period of time that has now lasted for a very long time. And in that time, people have suffered and cultures have struggled all because of the fall. Now, before I read the passage to you today, I need to tell you that this series is probably going to be the most difficult series that I will ever teach you as your pastor. I have to say things over the next four weeks that are going to be really hard for me to say. That means that you are going to hear some things over the next four weeks that are going to be really, really hard for you to hear. And while it may be the hardest series I will ever teach, it may also be the most important series that I ever teach. The, the verses that I'm going to be teaching this week and especially over the next three weeks, they are some of the most criticized passages in the entire Bible. People don't just criticize these passages. There are many people in America who hate these passages. Now, do you know why these verses evoke so much emotion? Why people are so eager to criticize or even hate these verses? It's because these verses are so relevant to our lives. If it didn't convict us, we wouldn't care. But it does convict us. And so we do care. And in so many ways, people respond to these verses by getting really, really defensive. Do not get defensive. You need to trust today and over the next three weeks that God loves you. And you need to be open to anything and everything that he wants to say to you. With that in mind, I'm going to read to you now from Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 23. Paul wrote, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Now, I know that for a lot of people, they read these verses and it feels like Paul is taking a quick turn 
to negative town. But all that Paul is trying to do is he's trying to explain to us a hard reality so that we can better deal with that reality. As Paul begins, he starts by talking about a very hard reality. He talks about the wrath of God. I want you to think about that word wrath with me for a minute. That word wrath is not just an anger or an emotion that God feels, that this is an emotion that God acts on. A lot of Bible scholars would say that God's wrath is a type of righteous, violent anger. Others, like John Piper, simply describe God's wrath by saying that it is both terrible and it is eternal. Now, sadly, there are a lot of people in the world who do not even believe in something like God's wrath. In fact, they believe that God is so full of love that, that there's no room for something in God like this thing called wrath. And when you think like that, you're thinking about it all wrong. The, the reason that God has wrath is because he is full of love. Okay, As a father, you understand this. If you rolled up on a scene and someone was hurting your kids because you love your kids, you would unleash your wrath on the person who was hurting your children. The same is true in God. God is not going to sit back with a passive approach while people hurt his kids or while his kids hurt themselves. God absolutely has wrath, but his wrath is rooted in his love. In fact, I would argue that the reason that we all have wrath is because God has wrath. We are people who have been made in his image. We have been made in his likeness. And so the wrath that lives in us is a wrath that we got from our father. Now, what's really ironic about wrath is that nobody has a problem with their own wrath, right? But because your wrath always feels justified, at least in your own mind. But we all have a problem with God's wrath. And the reason we have a problem with God's wrath is because God's wrath deters me from doing what I really want to do. As Paul talks about the concept of God's wrath, he says that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. Now, when I read that verse, in many ways, I think about that Liam Neeson movie called Taken. How many of you remember this movie? You've seen this movie? Most of you have seen this movie. In that movie, you might remember that, that Neeson's daughter, he, she travels overseas with some friends and going to go see another part of the world. And while she's in the airport, she meets this really cute young guy who finds out where she's staying. And when they leave and they part ways, the really cute young guy who now knows where he, she's staying goes and tells some of his criminal cohorts where the girls are staying so that they can break into her home, kidnap them, and then force them into sex slavery. Right before she is kidnapped, she is under the bed and she is talking to her dad on the phone who is back in the United States. She is terrified. She is crying out to her father saying, you got to do something. They're breaking in to take me. As they're coming in, they find her under the bed. They drag her out. They take her phone. And while he still has them on the phone, Neeson says this to the kidnappers. He says, I don't know who you are and I don't know what you want. If you're looking for a ransom, I can tell you I don't have money. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills that I have acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. If you let my daughter go now, that will be the end of it. I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will look for you, I will find you, and I will kill you. The rest of the movie is a movie about a father who reveals his wrath against the people who have hurt his daughter, the daughter that he loves. And if you are a person who loves justice, then you are a person who loves that movie. Paul says 
that if you just look throughout the history of the world, then you will see that there have been many different moments in human history where God has unleashed or unrevealed his wrath against people a number of different times. It's been revealed against the godlessness and the wickedness that we see in our world. Why? Because God uses his wrath as a deterrent in this world. He sees the behaviors that are causing people to suffer. He sees the behaviors that cause cultures to go corrupt. And because God is for people, he unleashes his wrath against people who are hurting themselves or hurting other people or the cultures by acting in godless and wicked ways. God's wrath really is a deterrent that is designed to keep people from acting like a bunch of wild animals. Now, the question is, how do people respond to this deterrent? Well, Paul tells us how we respond to the deterrent. But because he's seen it over and over again, many different times throughout the history of the world, Paul said that we suppress the truth by our wickedness. Just like the bad guys ignored the warnings of Liam Neeson and said, we're going to persist in doing the wrong thing, even when they started to experience his wrath, we do the exact same things. We ignore what God has said. We ignore the wrath that has been revealed. We ignore what God is doing, and we persist in doing whatever we want to do. I mean, be honest with yourself for just a second. Have you ever had someone in your life who saw what you were doing? They told you the truth, but you didn't want to hear the truth. And so you suppressed the truth. Maybe you had a family member who saw the road you were on and they said, man, you you don't want to do that. You're going to jeopardize your entire career. Maybe you had a friend who said, well, what are you doing? I, I see the relationship that is forming with that coworker. You, you don't want to do that. You're going to ruin your family. You don't have friends like that or family members like that. I know this about you. You got a pastor like that because I talk about this stuff all the time to try to protect you and help you enjoy God's good, pleasing, and perfect will for your life. But some people don't want to hear it. And so they suppress it. I want you to understand that word suppress. A lot of you uh, who are gun enthusiasts, you know all about this word suppress, right? Because when you shoot a gun, what you've learned is that that gun is very, very loud and you don't want to hear it. And because you don't want to hear it, you go out and you buy a device that is called a a silencer or a suppressor. That's exactly right. You can still hear it, but, but it's much more faint compared to what it once was. Paul says that we deal with the truth in the exact same way. Sometimes there's a truth about a behavior in our lives, and we don't want to hear it because that truth is confronting us. That, that truth is calling us out. It's requiring us to change, and we don't want to change. It's making us aware of the fact that there is a wickedness in our lives that will either hurt us or it may hurt other people, but we suppress what other people are trying to tell us, or we suppress what God has already clearly told us in his word. Can I ask you, have you tried to suppress a truth about a behavior in your life? And I'm not just talking about throughout your whole life. I'm really talking about right now. Like maybe other people are trying to warn you. Maybe right now in this message, you feel like God is really trying to warn you, but, but you've been trying to ignore what everyone's saying, forget about what everyone else is saying, rationalize your way around it. Let me tell you something. That does not work with God. Listen again to what Paul said in verses 19 and 20. He said, what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. 
For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. If you're using your Romans Bible journal, I want you to circle those last two words of verse 20, without excuse. There is no excuse for disobeying God. We may not like the way it is, but we cannot change the way it is, and we should not try to create a bunch of excuses for why we don't submit to the way it is. Paul said, it is as plain as day because God has made it plain as day. But oftentimes what we do, is we throw common sense right out the window and we start playing mind games with ourselves. We try to rationalize and we try to justify why it is okay for us to do whatever we want to do and we completely ignore what God has said. How do we do that? We suppress the truth by our wickedness. We stop going to church. <laughs> Gonna take a little break. <laughs> don't want to go during the Dark Ages series. I'll catch you in the next series, right? I don't want to hear it, right? But we stop reading our Bibles. What well, we know we're struggling with something, but we're not genuinely praying about it because we don't want to hear what God has to say. We stop hanging around the Christian people who tell, who tell us what we don't want to hear, and we find a new group of friends who will tell us whatever we do want to hear. That's why Paul said in verse 21, their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Have you ever seen that in a person? That, that when they were getting caught up in something that you knew and they knew, they do not need to be caught up in this. What happens? You, you find a kind of darkness that consumes them, man. You, you can't reason with them. You can't seem to get through to them. Why? Because darkness is taking a hold of them. Paul says that their thinking became futile. That word futile actually means that it serves no useful purpose. And so when you're in one of those seasons of your life where you're kind of running from God, you're rebelling, you're trying to suppress the truth, you need to know that that way of thinking to try to justify your behavior or rationalize your behavior, that way of thinking serves no useful purpose. It's not helping you. It's actually hurting you. Not only does your mind start to change, but what's even scarier than that, Paul says your heart start, starts to change. Paul said their foolish hearts were darkened. Well, you think about that for just a minute. That their mind is now useless and their heart has now gone dark. Paul says that people like that, they exchange the glory of an immortal God for mere images that are made to look like mortal beings. I want you to do me a favor in verse 23. I want you to circle that word exchange. Have any of you ever been to the New York Stock Exchange? Can I see your hands if you have? Okay, no one has, a couple of people have been to the New York Stock Exchange. Even if you haven't been there, then you know that the New York Stock Exchange is a place where people make all kinds of trades, right? Some people make really good trades, and some people make really bad trades, right? Bill Huang may have made the worst trade ever. According to Market Watch, Bill Huang lost $35 billion in what was called a spectacular trading implosion. Not only did he lose $35 billion, but he lost it all in just under a week. <laughs> that, my friends, is what we would call a terrible trade. Now, a lot of people make terrible trades, but listen to me very carefully. The trade that the Apostle Paul is talking about, that trade is even worse than the trade that Bill Fong made. Paul says that from the very beginning of time, the earliest days of human history, people have been trading the glory of of an immortal God 
for mere images that are made to look like a mortal being. Think about that. People can choose between God and anything else. And sadly, a lot of people choose anything else. They choose anything else because deep down inside, they don't really want God. What we really want is to be able to gratify our own evil desires. It is a terrible trade. And so I want to ask you, if you were going to make a terrible trade, what would that trade look like for you? We all have something in our lives that lures us away from God. And so my question is, what is that for you? Is it a relationship that could come between you and God? Is it the pursuit of more money, more power, or more promotions? Is it a sin that you're not willing to let go of? I don't know what it is, but I bet right now you know what it is. Do not make that trade. Instead, make a really good trade. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul tells us about the best trade ever. Listen to what he said. He said, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is a thing called grace. When Paul is talking about him who had no sin, you know what he's talking about? Yes, the answer is always Jesus in church, right? He's talking about Jesus. And Paul says that Jesus, who had no sin, he became sin for us. In fact, you can see that moment in his life when it happened. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, Jesus is praying to his Father in heaven. And in that prayer, Jesus cries out and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is why. But because on the cross, the man who had no sin, he became sin for us. He took our sin and in exchange, he gave us his righteousness so that we would no longer be under the wrath of God. Think about that. Jesus put himself under the wrath of God so that he could put you under the grace of God. That is is a great trade, and anyone in their right mind would make that trade all day, every single day. All you got to do to make the trade is become a follower of Jesus. That, that when you trust in Jesus and you start to follow Jesus, he doesn't just forgive your sins and make you right with God. He starts to show you the right way to live. And in doing so, what he does is he leads you out of the dark ages, and he leads you into a kind of life that is a lot more like the life that God always intended for you to live. It's not a perfect life because it's not a perfect world, but it is a far better life than the alternative where we continue to live in the dark ages. Let's pray together. If you are here today and you do not have a relationship with Jesus, I know that the idea of God's wrath can be a scary thought. In fact, the truth is the reason I became a follower of Jesus at the age of 14 is because I was afraid of going to hell. And while I wish that I had a more pious answer for you than that, and I wish that I could say, oh, I just loved God and loved everything I saw about Jesus. Hearing a message about the reality of God's wrath was enough to say, I want Jesus to forgive my sins and to lead my life. For some of you today, you need to make that decision. I'm not trying to scare you into getting out of hell or getting into heaven, but, but I am talking about a truth about God that, that a lot of people never think about. And so today, right where you sit, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I want you to confess 
right where you sit. God, I need Jesus to forgive my sins. I I need Jesus to save me from your wrath. So God, I'm trusting in Jesus, not just to forgive my sins, but I'm believing that Jesus can lead my life and lead me out of the dark ages and into the kind of life that you always intended for me to live. If that's a prayer that you're praying, I want you to let us know because we would love as a church family to celebrate with you by baptizing you at our beach baptism that's coming up in a few weeks. You could drop by the Connect desk. You can hop online and fill out the info cards about being baptized and let us know that you made a decision to follow Jesus today so that we can celebrate with you in the near future. But for those of you who are followers of Jesus, I just want to ask you, are you thinking about making a terrible trade? If so, don't make that trade. It's not worth it. God is worth it. I need you to trust him. And I need you to walk away from that sin. I need you to walk away from that relationship. I need you to walk away from that pursuit. And I need you to commit your life right here to to following after God, making him the priority and not letting anything become come between you and him. God, we thank you so much for this hard truth. I I know, God, that it's not really the the kind of message that we want to hear, but I also know It's a message that this world needs to hear. And so, God, I pray that you might take today's message and that you might use it to transform our hearts and our minds and our lives, deepen our love for Jesus. Help us to follow you more closely because of what we have heard today. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.